I think I ruined the big reveal. You probably already saw the thumbnail in the title to this video, so... But if you were just clicking randomly on the internet and you just blindly ended up on this video, you're in for a big surprise. Welcome to The Green Room, I'm Bob Bledsoe. About a month ago, I picked up one of my bucket list species and I'm really excited about her. The black-headed python is unlike any other python in the world. Well, that's not true, it's kind of like a woma python. But that's because black-headed pythons and womas are the only two members of the Aspidites genus. Deadly. We're talking about black-headed pythons today. So stupid. Kent, are you, do you have something to say? No, I'm just, I'm filming. Just getting the old shots in. Okay. He's gonna get us freaking killed. We're talking black-headed pythons today, and I'm by no means an expert on these snakes, but I have Derek Roddy on a Zoom call with me for this video, and he's an expert. But for now, let's go outside and I'll show you the snake. Sorry about the construction noise, you guys. There's construction happening in Burbank, apparently. This is Maya. She is a about a year and a half old black-headed python. And prior to picking her up, I had consumed probably all the information that's on the internet and on various podcasts about black-headed pythons just because I was interested. And then since picking her up, I consumed all that information again. There's not a lot of information on them. And I am by no means an expert on this species, really just a beginner and starting to learn about them. But I'll tell you some basics as this plane flies by. There's so much noise out here, you guys. I apologize. Here's the basics. Black-headed pythons and womas, the, the entire Aspidites genus, uh, is endemic to Australia. These guys live in the Northern Territory, Western Australia. They are a fossorial species, so they're spending a lot of time underground, but unlike ball pythons, they're not waiting for food to come to them. They are actively hunting, traveling up to a third of a mile a day for snacks. And those snacks consist of other reptiles. About 90% of their diet is other reptiles. So they're eating blue tongue skinks, goannas, which are Australian for monitor lizard, uh, lots of bearded dragons and other snakes, including the most venomous snakes in the world. They'll eat death adders and brown snakes and such like that. So that's kind of crazy. Apparently they're immune to the venom of those snakes. The head always looks like it's just been dipped in wet tar and it's not wet, but it is shiny. And apparently it's used for probably a couple different reasons, but the main one is that they will poke their head out of a burrow and rather than bringing their entire body out and being exposed to predators and such, they can just pop their head out of a burrow, warm up, get their brain going and get the rest of their body going because their head is basically a solar panel. So I jumped on this Zoom call with Derek Roddy because I think it's important to seek out people who know more than you about a, a species, especially if it's a new uh, animal and he was nice enough to be willing to chat with me. The plan was to talk about this snake a little bit and cut to Derek occasionally for to fill in some gaps, but we talked for almost two hours on that Zoom call, so there was a lot of editing that had to be done. I figured this video would be about 15 or 20 minutes. It's gonna be a lot longer than that, but we're gonna learn a lot about the black-headed python. So here we go. Derek Roddy, thank you so much for joining me for this. Um little conversation about black-headed pythons. Um, oh, you, in, in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you are the guy in the United States who has been breeding them like consistently the longest. There's kind of a handful of guys that have been doing it for a little while, but, but you seem to be the dude. Yeah, I don't know why that is. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a few of us. How, well, how long, how long have you been doing it? You know, Jim's... Uh, I got my first pair in 2001 and my first clutch in 2005, although I only hatched a couple of babies. I was on tour a lot. You know, I'm right. a musician and yeah, yeah, I do all of that stuff. So I was touring a lot and I didn't really have a lot of time uh, to really pay attention. And to be honest, they kind of caught me, maybe caught me off guard a little bit uh, with the eggs. And so my wife, she had to deal with that, all of that. And, uh, but 2006 was a really good year. 2007 was a really good year. For the average pet keeper, why a black-headed python? Um, they're a big, wet noodle. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're very energetic. They're, they seem to have a lot more awareness of things around them. Like they're more like a monitor. 
in that way. And I got here earlier, so they they kind of lost interest in me. But anytime I come in here first of the day, every one of them are telescoping up, looking around, seeing what the moment they feel that door close, uh, they they all start paying attention. And there, are they, they check they checking to see if you're about to feed them? They just checking to see what's going on in general. I think. I think they're very uh, aware, whereas some of like my carpet pythons don't really do that so much. They just kind of sit there and do their thing. Interesting. I, you now, know, one I found... thing I will say about blackheads is they are extremely food aggressive. There's not a snake in this room that won't try to get you. <laughs> That's um, really funny. You know, I had a theory about that. And of course, I've had my one blackhead python for only a few weeks now so my theories are are nothing but the the one that that i have has i've held her for a long time i held her a long time at the show when i got her held her almost every day if she wasn't digesting um and she never tried to bite me and then i handed her off to lucy and she within a minute was on her arm <laughs> it does not Lu hurt lucy what's happening here i just got bit by what? By a snake. By a black, a black <laughs> That's never happened. But... Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we're going to handle this. You want to wrap it. Spraying a little whiskey in her mouth really helped. Not in Lucy's mouth, but the snakes. Um... <laughs> so Lucy, you have on, on your arm here, you yes. have the teeth marks of a snake of some sort. Yes. Wh which, which snake is that? Uh, this is Maya, and she is a blackhead python. Right, and who do those teeth marks belong to? Maya, the blackhead python. And yet you're still holding her? She's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgiven her. It hurt a little bit, but you know what? She's cute, so I'm okay with it. So my theory was, well, maybe she, maybe she knows my smell and she realizes that I'm not food, and so she hasn't tried to buy me, because I... I grabbed her and I was like let's see if she bites me and she wouldn't um well here's the thing they don't they're not usually like that when they're young like the moment they hit three years old oh that's really when you got to be careful yeah I mean it's very rare that I have one that you know bitey when they're young that's one out of every you know 15 or 20 animals oh that's interesting but the moment they get some size and the moment they get confident enough to realize that they're not prey for anything else, it's on. <laughs> so when, they can, when, they're, when they're actually big enough to maybe do a little damage, then they start biting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's not like, you know, it's not an aggressive thing at all. Like I've never sure. had a blackhead in the 20 years I've been keeping these things. I've never had one bite me out of defense. They'll headbutt with their mouth open. They'll lunge at you. They hiss. They carry on. They don't bite. They only bite out of food response. If, if they think you're food, yeah. Yeah, and then they don't let go. <laughs> right. That's they're why you gotta like have a little spray bottle of whiskey. You know, they're not like anything else where, uh, oh, that's not food. Right. And I think a lot of the reason for that is, you know, these animals eat reptiles in the wild mostly, um, and depending on the locale, almost completely. And you know, we're assist feeding them because you have to assist feed them all when they're when they're hatched mm -hmm. usually very i've had one in a hundred that will actually eat wow um, but you have to assist feed them you're assist feeding them mammals we're mammals so i think that they really don't get the distinction that some other animals can have because they do eat mammals like they know the difference between a wallaby and a rodent you know like a, a rat or a mouse like they can blackheads they're not as picky uh, right they just mammal grab it and that's what we've been teaching them to do so that's what they do let me ask you about that i keep finding all this different information i find old information t saying that blackheads don't have heat pits and then i find people saying no they've got one right under their scale they've got and then one they're under saying the rostrum. Yeah, and then they're saying that they have them, but they're just under their scales, so they have more than one. But I haven't seen any science on it. I haven't been able to find um, any papers. The only thing that's been done was done by Adrian Hogg and Dave McIntosh over in Australia. And Dave had been saying for years, all blackheads have heat pits. If you've ever kept a blackhead, you would know that they do. And um, that's, that's very true. But the monocular study that they did showed that that horseshoe shape under the rostral was their heat pit. 
Interesting. Yeah. So they do have at least one. They have one because they do spend a lot of time in burrows. You can see why they wouldn't have external heat pits. Sure. Right. Yeah, they get all plugged up. And then, you know, I've heard this excuse too. People say all the time, well, you know, well, they don't need heat pits because they eat cold blooded animals. But that's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard because these cold blooded animals will be 115 degrees sitting in the sun they're having to warm up they still have to keep their body yeah, warm. they, they still warm up i mean yeah. and once they collect enough they'll go to their burrow and they'll maintain that heat so they still have a heat signature so it sounds like with with their food response beyond three years old it sounds like they're probably not a beginner snake well they can be um like i said they're real they're real uh Placid. It's actually really hard to get bit by one if you're paying attention and you don't let it like. They do that. They're so slow, too, right? They're really slow about it. They don't Uh, strike like. Sometimes they do. It depends on their, it depends on the day. (laughs) Really? (laughs) I've got some man that, you know, you think, wow, what happened? You know, why does this snake go crazy all of a sudden? But yeah, just depends, I guess. The other day I had uh, my, uh, out and and um she was just and it was nighttime and i thought okay if i'm gonna get bit it's probably gonna be now because she's probably looking for food and just i didn't even see it but all of a sudden my finger ended up in her mouth but all i had to do was just touch her face i thought i was gonna have to get the whiskey to spray in but i just touched her face and she let go and yeah sometimes they will i one time i had uh one of my bigger snakes tiger um I, I had somebody over here. I can't remember what I was doing. I slid his cage open and I said, look, you know, these guys are pretty calm. They don't really do much. And I put my hand right in beside his head. Like if this was his head, I put my hand right here and he did this. He went. And just let go. <laughs> and just laid back down. Yeah. But he grabbed that's... me and then immediately let go and just laid himself back down. That's Maybe. interesting. So he must've just realized, Oh, that's not food. Maybe. Yeah. For you, my guess is that you're probably keeping them on paper. You've got all those really nice big cages, but but you've got all their the stuff that they need. Somebody that just has one and and they're going to keep it as a pet, how would you recommend that, that they set up with regard to humidity, heat, substrate, such like that? Um, you know, they're pretty similar to any other snake. You know, you don't want to be too high. You don't want to be too low. I mean, my humidity in here i would probably say average is maybe 60 to 70 percent maybe it seems like they're all over the place as far as the northern australian territory so they're they're on the edges of forests they're out in the deserts so their humidity yeah. level and even their temperatures can be probably a pretty wide range oh yeah my buddy dave over there he is temp gun blackheads at 115 degrees wow <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you would think like, wow, that's like really hot for an animal. But the difference is, is they can get away from it if they want to. They can just go sure. to burrow or whatever. I'm sure they can tolerate temperatures probably even higher than that. Yeah. What What are but your? It's not what, something you want to keep them at. Sure. Yeah. 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 What are those bulbs? Do you temp gun under those bulbs that you have? Yeah. So, I have a solar panel outside that feeds this room. So when the sun comes up, the lights come on. The sun oh, goes cool. Down, they go up. So they get the natural cycle. And I, I haven't really ever understood why people give animals heat at night because when the sun is gone, it's gone. Right. I mean, there may be some residual heat on a road or a rock or whatever, but that happens inside the cages as well. I mean, those, once those lights go off, it's not like the temperature just stops and it drops. Right, right. It takes all night long for that temperature to drop, just like it would naturally, like the coldest parts of the day or at five six in the morning before the sun comes up sure Um, so that's how i kind of operated it here so this cage is probably like if i was if i was a tip gun under that bulb it's about 93 sometimes if the room's a little hotter it might be 94 over here it's going to be closer to like 85 86 and then at night it'll drop down to about 77 78 in the cage the light bulbs are only 15 watts so you can hold them like you can put your hand right on that thing and hold it for 20 minutes it won't burn oh it's not hot hot. right right you know so uh, but it is enough 
in that kind of PVC that it will hold the temp and it will make it just right. So somebody that doesn't want to keep them on paper, would you think Aspen? Yeah. I mean, anything is good. They, they love to dig. Um, blackheads are messy. So half of the reason that I don't uh, use any kind of substrate is because it gets everywhere. Right. So they're not they're. It seems like they're just really hardy and they'll, they'll, it's, it, so to me, um, they will handle hotter temperatures than say a ball python. Oh yeah. Um, and probably cooler temperatures than a ball python. Oh yeah. You know, if we're you saying. You really have to python, try to kill one. What's you that? You really have to try. Oh, to kill one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you really have to try to kill one. The only uh, way that you can actually damage one is overfeeding. Oh, right. Um, Let's talk about that. Yeah, because uh, these animals in the wild, they're constantly eating. Uh, my same friend, Dave, um, he watches these things closely in the wild. Does a lot of wildlife, uh, you know, information for people or whatnot. And he's radio tracked these things and seen these things eat, you know, six or eight food items in a week's time. The difference is, is what they're eating. So what they're eating has zero fat. These like bearded dragon or frilled lizard or other snakes, these things are lean. They, they have no fat. And a lot of people don't realize that the actual prey item itself is not where these animals get their nutrition, not just blackheads, but any animal. The gut load is where the nutrition is at. And I think in captivity, I mean, people say they feed rat food. It's still dog food. It's not good for these animals. Um, so I, I subscribe by the fact that like the smaller the stomach is, the better the food item is for this animal. So I would rather give, instead of giving like a large rat that you would feed a seven foot snake, any other seven foot snake, it's got all that fat. It's got this big gut that's full of dog food. Mm -hmm. um, instead of doing that I would feed like three smaller items during the week not all at once but instead of that large rat I would feed a small on Monday a small on Thursday a small on Sunday a small on Wednesday a small on Saturday you know what I mean sure. and it, that more accurately represents how they're eating in the wild. And it actually gets more food into them over time because their, their system is constantly moving. Right, right. I read somewhere that, um, and maybe what I read was an exaggeration because this sounds crazy, but I read somewhere that they tracked black-headed pythons in the wild and they were finding that they would eat like 12 to 15 bearded dragons in a week. Yeah, well, that's what I was just saying. I mean, they, they're, they're eating constantly constantly they eat roadkill i mean i've got pictures of of them like just eating dead monitors off the road. have you experimented with feeding them weird things like what's the weirdest thing you've ever fed a blackhead well not intentionally but i had a <laughs> I had a customer call me one day flipping out she was uh <clears throat> she she was having lunch the phone rang she put her lunch down her blackhead was out she did the phone thing came back and the blackhead had eaten her hot dog, had mustard and ketchup all over him, and like completely <laughs> just eaten the entire hot dog. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, they'll they'll eat whatever. I mean, you can give them eggs. They'll eat eggs. They, <laughs> they sound like a monitor. It's like feeding a monitor lizard. Yeah. Yeah, they're more, they're like, their contact, their eyes, and that's how they observe everything is very monitor-like. This is probably a good time to cut to Kent's corner. Kent, you want to roll your thing? Hi, welcome to Kent's Corner, the corner that everybody would like to be in. Except you can't because it's my corner. I mean, technically it's my brother's, but it's... Welcome to Kent's Corner! As a trusted news source, I'd like to share some facts also about the black-headed python. I wrote some down. Fact number one. Black-headed pythons are from Australia. Fact number two. Every day, multiple people in Australia die. Hmm... I wonder why that is. Fact number three. The black-headed python looks like it's wearing a ski mask, which makes them more like a burglar or bank robber than any other python snake. Number four. Regardless of how much they look like a criminal, it's important to note that all pythons have many teeth, most often located in their mouth, which is how they would eat you. Fact number five. If you... Fact number five. 
Have you ever met an Australian who died of old age? Me either. Also, there are koalas in Australia, and I don't trust any species of bear. Please use these facts when writing to Green Room Python's management about why they should take it easy on the friggin' pythons in there. God. Thank you for watching Ken's Corner, where everybody goes to learn about facts. Inspiring, Kent. Thanks for your perspective. A lot of times overfed blackheads, especially females, they just stop producing. Um, they'll produce one, two, three clutches, and then they'll never produce again. Sure. Um, so that's what typically happens, and I think that's why it, a lot of the old schoolers, you know, didn't have a lot of success with them because they were raising them to 10 feet. I've seen some that big around. I know. It's like, crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. And they would never – I mean, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures of wild blackheads. I've been to Australia several times. I've seen them in the wild. I've never seen one any bigger around than that. Wow. Not can you one. can you pull out one of your breeding females? Like, what's a good size for a, for, um, for a producing female for you? I mean, really, that that is a small black-headed python versus the ones that, that we see that are, like, as big around as my head. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I have some that are, that are bigger, you know. But she's about the size of one of those. Uh, I mean, she's not quite as big as a Coke can. Not quite. Right. Almost. Right. You know. Definitely the size of one of the smaller, like, 12-ounce Coke cans, you know? Yeah. Um, and she's a tiger, you said, right? That, yeah, you want to see her up close. So that is the, that's the, the jet black down her back. Yeah, solid right. black. The solid black yeah. without the guts. Yeah, wow, she's beautiful. Do you keep Walmas? Yes, I do. What, what would you say is the difference uh, if, if I'm... If I'm a pet keeper and I'm considering a Woma versus a black-headed python, other than very size, similar. they're very what's that? similar. Very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Um, they typically the same types of behaviors, that type of thing. Um, other than I hear the people price say, black head, eh, "What's so that?" <laughs> so other than the price and the black head, it's not so much difference. Okay, I've I've heard people say, "Well, the size difference, though, right?" I mean, the black heads are bigger. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard people say that the black-headed pythons are less bitey, but that's not your experience. No, not afraid. really. I mean, they're all bitey. Like I said, you're they're opportunistic feeders. They're going to grab whatever. And they're, you know, they're not constrictors in the traditional sense because these animals hunt a lot of burrows. Um, most of these blackheads just come over and grab and eat. <coughs> Now I'm feeding frozen, thawed, so they don't have to fight anything. But even when I, I have to try to get them to wrap stuff up for the most part, you know. Right. In a burrow, they don't have the space. They'll just grab something and push it up against the wall. They're pinning like, stuff against the wall. It. Let's talk about cannibalism really quick. Okay. Has it ever happened to you with black-headed pythons? Do you know of it happening to other people? I know of it happening. Okay. I, have, I haven't had it happen to me. <laughs> um, is it something you're although, concerned about when you pair them no no not at all do you ever bring yours out and let them roam like do you bring them outside all the time um, i have cages outside so all of these animals in here they get outdoor cage time once a week at least cool and i just alternate them out you know nice so i have some wood and wire cages out um, on the back side of this place where it's like it gets sun exposure but not a you know lot like 100 percent you know and i can leave them there and they get you know full sun and they do their thing they get exposure to that thing and, um, cool. i also have a, a vacant lot on the other side of me here so a lot of times i'll take them over to the vacant lot let them crawl around a lot of times they'll use the bathroom out there and it's, it's just sometimes easier than, than having to clean cages and stuff right that's cool that, that you let them have some natural behavior time. Oh, yeah. are, you, are you worried about losing them down a hole? I feel like if they would if they saw a <laughs> hole in the lawn, they'd be gone. Man, they investigate every blade of grass. Like you put them down and it's just... Really? Back to them. Super slow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you come up on them or if they feel a shadow come over them, they'll, you know, they'll take off. You know, but they they don't really do much. What would you say that for a healthy black-headed python, what's the average lifespan? 
25, 30 years? Okay, so the oldest living one that I could find in captivity that has any kind of records died in this room at 24 years old. Wow. That's the oldest living one I can find. 24. And the, the ones that are as thick around as my head, how long oh, would they you make it about living? seven or eight years? Yeah. Die of fatty liver disease or whatever other complications. Almost always. Yeah, see my light. It just makes it the lighting in here just makes her look white. Yeah, she's beautiful though. Wow. Is that better? Oh, there we go. That does it. Yeah, but I mean, she looks as she still looks as in the. Yeah, you you can get an idea. Now she looks over seven feet. What do you think she is? Uh, she's probably seven. Seven. Yeah. 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 Um, wow, she's beautiful. Oh yeah. A ball python pretty much just curls up in their cage and hangs out in, unless you actively bring them out to, to move around a bit. Right. These guys seem much more, they move, they move around a lot more. They're active hunters. They, they're not ambush predators like a ball or like a boa or a carpet. Or, they, they're actively out diurnal during the day. They're actively out looking for food. One of my goals here at Green Room Pythons is to work with a number of different python species so that I can showcase them and compare them and show them to people. I think the black-headed python is a very different species and works really well within the family here at Green Room Pythons. I picked her up as a direct result of the Patreon supporters. I used that money to buy her. They are helping this channel grow and get better and better and there's some other things in the works that will be happening as a result of these supporters. Look at this, here's a new board. You wanna be in this new board? Pa Patreon.com slash greenroompythons. Now you might be thinking, oh, Bob, that's just a ploy to get more snakes. Well, I mean, you're, you're not wrong, but there's more to it than that. I let my ball pythons roam the house, my big ones can roam the house. And I have, I've got a, a big ladder station for my super dwarf reticulated pythons. When she's, now she's not up to size where I would just let her roam the house. But when she is, um, she's probably, you know, my ball pythons will climb under this couch that I'm sitting on or they'll go behind the mirror and station themselves. And then they're pretty much there for several hours. She's right. probably just going to keep roaming, right? And get herself into trouble is my guess. Yeah, I mean, they, they go everywhere. I, in fact, uh, about four days ago, I had a pair push the door open. I forgot to put my lock in it. And there's nowhere they can go in here. I mean, it's not really any place they can get. But right. They pushed their way out. One went into another rack system and went in between, about halfway up, went in between some cages. She went into the baby room and went as high as she could get close to the ceiling and was curled up on top of a box. Interesting. So, How long did it take you to find them? Not long. It's easy in here because like I said, there's just, it's just cages. Nowhere to go. Not much to yeah. It seems like they would need, uh, unless you, unless they were in a room like that where they couldn't go anywhere, but, but they, they need more supervision than a ball python where I can predictably oh, say, yeah, all right, they're under the couch. Yeah. They'll disappear. They'll be like one minute. You're there's that black head. You go get some water, rants for a phone call, come back. Where's this thing at? <laughs> right, right. You know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a cool thing about them is that they're they're active and they're always moving. You know, like she's she hasn't stopped since I picked her up. Your your biggest year? How how many clutches did you have? Nine. You had nine clutches. So yeah, let's say what? To, I think it was seventy four babies, maybe. That's what I was gonna say. About seventy five, something like that, babies. Assist feeding all of them, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. For how long? A few months? Um, the Westerns are longer. The, the Westerns are much harder to get going. Like the Xanthic lines, you assist feed them once, twice. They're pretty good to go. My tangerine line, 30% of those will eat on their own. Wow. Plain is you just leave it in there and they'll go. Um, so I think it just really depends on how much exposure like the animal has to, you know, mammals in the wild. Uh, Northern Territory, the one Northern Territory line that I'm talking about comes uh, close to Darwin. So there's a lot more human habitation, which means there would be a lot more rodents. 
right? Right. Uh, you don't. I mean, where there's where there's not humans, there's not rodents. I don't know if you know that or not, but rodents pretty much rats and mice they pretty much only exist around humans interesting yeah so like out in the bush so to speak i mean not saying there aren't mammals out there there are but rats and mice are really kind of hard to come by i mean as far as having a pet i i definitely would say hands down they're probably going to be the most entertaining of, of all the state species because they just they're they're a hoot to keep you know Thank you so much. Uh, re yeah, really yeah. appreciate you being here, and uh, done, we'll done. we'll we'll talk soon. We'll we'll talk about uh, a male for this girl in the coming year or so. Yeah, I have a perfect one for her right now, actually. Really cool. Yeah, he's cool. Beautiful. You want to see him? Yeah, I do. <laughs> So if you're considering potentially getting a black-headed python, you're probably making a good choice. They are a fascinating and really hardy species. Uh, there are a handful of good breeders out there that are that are breeding black-headed pythons. Um, you can't go wrong with one of Derek's animals, though, and you can find him at Derek Roddy's blackheadedpythons.com. He's also on Facebook, and uh, I'm sure he's on Instagram, too. I'm not I think he is. I think he's on Instagram also. Uh, so anyway, I hope that you enjoyed learning about black-headed pythons today, and I hope you enjoyed Maya, and I'll see you next week. Hundred percent head is anthic, and he's beautiful. He's Fifty percent head is anthic for the other line and tiger. What's oh, what? Man, what would you sell that guy for? Um, he'd probably be in the four K range. Yeah.